translation today. Um, so if you brought your King James Bible, uh, I apologize. I could warn you next time to bring your NLT Bible, uh, or maybe next week we'll be in the NASB. We'll be in the ESV, NIV, one of them. We'll be in one of them. We're going to be in the Word either way. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. A very cheerful thought to begin the Bible study tonight. But the Apostle Peter writes simply this, the end of the world is coming soon. It's a great phrase to launch a Wednesday night Bible study. All right, let's pray. So he says the, the end of the world is coming soon. It's not the end of the world as we know it. It is literally Peter referring to the end of the world for it is later that Peter talks about the elements that are burning up with a fervent heat. Everything we see around us is going to be completely done away with. And Peter viewed it as coming soon. Now, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be perfect or complete, not lacking or not wanting anything. And so Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, roughly 2,000 years ago, found it pressing in his day to remind the church the end of the world is coming soon. Now here we are, 2,000 years later. Tonight, we're just going to go through uh, a couple of verses from 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. Uh, the other morning, uh, the Lord, I believe it was the Lord, woke me up at about 3.30 and would not let me go back to sleep. It's kind of this thing we've been doing. Uh, when he wants to talk to me, he just gets me up at 3.30 in the morning. It's fantastic. We have a great time. Uh, but as I was reading through some scripture out in the living room, he, he really laid these verses upon my heart. And so here we are. 2,000 years ago, there was a mindset baked into the Apostle Peter that, that instructed him to believe, that instructed him to behave as if the end of the world was upon him. Now, do not make the mistake of thinking now what some thought then. There were those then that thought the seeming delay of the day of the Lord or of the coming of the Lord was a, a sign that it was not going to come to pass or a sign that it was all just a, a mystery or a myth or a hoax. But it is actually the grace of God that has delayed his coming. It is the mercy of God that is reaching for every soul, every, every person that is going to come into the kingdom. There is a time period, there is a space of grace, but in the mind of God and outside of time where God dwells and outside of time where you and I will be called to, the end of the world is indeed coming very soon. God in his sovereignty, left us with the, the mindset of an imminent return. He, he left us not knowing the exact day or the hour that he would be coming back. Can you imagine how differently we would live if we knew the exact moment, the exact day, and the exact hour? If we knew that it was going to be the year twenty. 33 on November 13th at 11:59 a.m. a trumpet was going to sound how differently would we live and yet God as as an act of mercy removes from us the knowledge of this certain day and this certain hour and only tells his church 
it's coming soon. And because it's coming soon, remember the task that I gave you and perform it. Live as if that day is about to happen. Live as if that moment was about to occur. Live as if that trumpet would sound today. Now, before we start thinking that God is delaying his coming, don't forget, you also don't know how long you have. I, I hope each and every one of us, if the Lord tarries, each and every one of us reaches that beautiful age of 99 to 100 years old and we get to see our grandchildren and our grandchildren's children and we get to see generation after generation rise up. But the simple truth is that somebody could choke on a breath mint and keel over right now in church and that could be the very end of it. So even if we did know when the Lord was coming back, you don't know how long that you have. But we do know this for certain. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the deeds that are done in our body as Paul writes to the church in Corinth. And so, as Peter warned the church in his day, I warn the church today in 2022, the end of the world, it, it is coming. And it is coming soon. I don't know the day. I don't know the hour, but our Lord and Savior told us it's not for us to know the day or the hour, but we have the power to fulfill his mission and his goal, his purpose until he comes. So Peter goes on and he tells the church and the rest of that verse, he says, therefore, because the end is coming soon. You weren't expecting this on a Sunday or a sunny Wednesday night. The end of the world is coming. Because the end of the world is coming, therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Now, this, this is a praying church. It is in the DNA. It is a, a stone in the foundation of what has been built in, in Watertown and in South Dakota. I recognize that and I applaud that. There are men and women in this church that pray frequently and pray fervently, that see prayers answered, that have a connection with the supernatural that has been developed through years of effort and years of prayer and years of focus. I do not discount that and I do not, uh, I do not discredit that. In fact, I point it out and I applaud it, but it would be foolish for us not to do what the book of Hebrews gives us license to do in Hebrews chapter 10 when the writer tells us to provoke one another to good works. See, the, the funny little thing about prayer is the more you pray, the more you want to pray. The more you actually engage in the discipline of prayer, the greater the fire for prayer begins to burn inside of your belly. The, the longer you pray, the more you can't wait until the next prayer meeting. And so Peter is addressing a church that they're going through persecution, they're going through hard times, and surely they've got a lifestyle of prayer, but he's poking them, he's prodding them, he's stirring them a little bit, he's encouraging them, he's telling them, look, we don't know when the end is, uh, so let's get back to praying, let's get back to pushing, let's get back to diving deeper in to prayer. We could take a survey. Perhaps we won't tonight, but in your own life for a moment, pause and ponder. Are you praying to the level and to the capacity that you believe God is calling you to? Or is there room for improvement in each of our lives? Is there, is there space for each of us to grow to become a better prayer, to become a more earnest prayer, to become a more diligent prayer? prayer. The word that the NLT translates as earnest, the KJV calls sober. It is a sound mind. The word in the Greek is related to the word from 2 Timothy that we discussed last week. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. It, it refers to an attitude of self 
discipline. Our God is a God of order. You can flash all the way back to the creation, and so you've got chaos. The Bible says in Genesis that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and God brought order out of chaos. He spoke, and he aligned, and he, he created lines. He said the darkness can only go that far. The sea can only go that far. He brought order and structure out of nothingness and chaos. You look through the beginning of your Bible, there is clear instruction and clear building plans given of a tabernacle. A structure was brought to a system of worship. God, uh, the God of the universe, allowed man a way to approach him, and he put some constraints, he put some guidelines, he put some things together to help man to approach him appropriately. In the New Testament, we read that all things should be done decently and in order. Does it not follow then that our prayer lives could be more ordered or could be more structured? Did not Jesus teach his disciples a model prayer? Did he not teach them as they came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray? He began to lay out for them a plan of prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but I've got maybe a touch of undiagnosed ADD. And I've medicated it with caffeine for all these years. And uh, it's coffee's greatest gift to me is to be able to help me to focus a little bit. But there has been an incredible tool for stretching prayer time. And that's just been to have an outline, to have... A list of, I, I know they, that prayer is not a list of needs, but having a list of things I want to pray about has greatly strengthened my prayer time because otherwise I step into a prayer closet and I'm five minutes in and I'm like, oh crud, what else was I going to pray about? Now, if it's all right, we'll be practical tonight in this place. I, I find it even more helpful to have this list not just in my head, but written down. And if it's on your phone, it provides ample opportunity for distraction because you're going to pull up your prayer list and all of a sudden there's going to be a notification that crops up and, and then all of a sudden you're pulled aside and you're focused on something else. See, we could grow in this depth if we would just be earnest and disciplined. Each of us has areas that we can grow. And as we come to God, I found it's, it's very it's very helpful for me to have a known list of areas that I'm going to cover or to have a, a plan that I'm going to, to work through. Now, I, I, I always, always, always want to yield to the flow of the Spirit. I'm not in any way, shape, or form telling you to come with a book and just read what's on the page. That's, that's not what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about having a guideline, having a, a structure that's added, having order and discipline added to your prayer. Discipline will keep you in a prayer meeting when flesh is feeling nothing. Order and structure will keep you moving in a prayer meeting where you're just praying by faith and the, the tingle isn't coming down your leg and you're, you're wondering, is God even hearing this? But a disciplined spirit will stick it out. And as you stick it out, more times than not, I've found that all of the sudden you find the vein and the channel that God is in and there's a flow of the Holy Ghost that steps into that moment and steps into that time. Anybody know what I'm talking about where all of the sudden you seem to get your channel on the same channel as the Lord and you feel that connection. You got there because you were disciplined enough to stay there. You were disciplined enough in a moment of prayer. You were earnest earnest enough. Why? Because the end of the world is coming. Tomorrow might not be here. I can't, I can't just write it off after 15 minutes when I'm not feeling the goosebumps and I'm not, I don't feel the, 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 the tingle in my spine and maybe I'm just not speaking in tongues just right and I feel like my tongue is heavy and my flesh is fighting, but I'm, I'm disciplined and I'm staying. Why? The end of the world is coming. I don't know if I get to pray tomorrow. I don't know if I get to, to approach the throne tomorrow. I don't know if I get to come back later today. And so I want to stay with him. He says we need to be watching unto prayer. 
he's talking about the manner and the, the, the custom that not only in the military, but in, in any home, there would be a watching for uh, either uh, violence to be done against them, or if the master was out, as is our case, you would be waiting at the door for the master to come home. When he comes home, he should not have to knock on the door, but a servant should be ready. As the master approaches the house, the door gets opened and he is let in. In the army, we had this thing called fire guard. And you drew an hour of fire guard pretty much every night. And uh, uh, Brother Gustafson, maybe some others know exactly what I'm talking about. And you would be aroused out of your bunk about five minutes prior to your shift by somebody with a red flashlight in your face. You would have to get up. You'd have to get in uniform. You would go stand out in the hallway. And for one hour of the night, you would stand in that spot and make sure that the bunk was not burning down. That was your job. Now, they would add some other duties. One guy would be on duty to stand at parade rest and make sure that the barracks was not burning down while everybody else slept. But the other guy... Uh, and usually it was done in pairs, or at least pairs, sometimes three, sometimes four, or more. The other guy was free to perform other tasks. They, we got really good at stripping, buffing, and waxing the floor while everybody else slept, in the dark, with a red flashlight. And I promise you, you did not want to fall asleep on fire guard, or everybody was in trouble. On more than one occasion, we were awoken in the middle of the night by an angry drill sergeant pounding on the side of the lockers and tossing people out of their beds. Why? Because somebody was supposed to be watching and they were sleeping. And the drill sergeant came and I, 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 could, have, I could have believed in that moment that the end of the world had come. It's two in the morning, you're being rushed outside, you're wearing t-shirts and flip-flops, and you're trying to figure out what's going on, and now you're doing jumping jacks and push-ups, and you're running, and you're sweating, and they're screaming, all because somebody was supposed to be watching, but they were asleep. God forbid that there is a church that is asleep when they're to be watching. The end of the world is upon us. What if we are the last generation of the apostolic church? What if we are the last decade of the apostolic church? What if that were possible? Maybe, I know, I know, we've heard it all of our lives, but what if this was really it? What if it was the end? What if we're going to stand in judgment next to Peter and next to Paul and next to a generation that 2,000 years ago lived with the fervency to believe that it was everything, this was it? Effective prayer is strategic, not scattered. It is, it is focused. It is directed. There should be a level of focus, a level of skill with a weapon the more that you are proficient with it. If you've ever seen somebody pick up a firearm for the first time, you can generally tell if it's their first time handling a firearm because they begin to sweep it across the room and you're like, whoa, hey, whoa, no, 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 no. Or even worse, could you imagine being on the battlefield next to somebody that has picked up a broadsword for the very first time? You, you don't have the skill with it, and so you're just kind of swinging it all over the place, and there is a great level of zeal, and surely God in his grace and in his mercy responds. He answers. There is answer to prayer, but as we grow in skill with the armor of God, and as we grow in comfort with it, and as we grow in our dexterity and in our understanding and study of the word, our prayer life as well should grow. Prayer can be taught. Prayer can be learned. It can be strengthened. It can be encouraged. It can be built up. To not do so is a recipe for frustration. It's a recipe for frustrated faith because it'll be less effective than it could be. A rifle in the hands of a marksman is an incredible tool. But a rifle in the hand of a toddler, it's dangerous. The chance is there. They might hit the, the, the mark. You, you might get it. But I don't want to rely on maybe. 
I want to grow in my, in my comfort in prayer. I want to grow in my proficiency in prayer. That's only going to come through diligent use of it. There is no magic potion that's going to make you some effective prayer warrior. You just have to be earnest, and you've got to be disciplined. In other words, you, you just have to do it. A resource I would direct us back to in September of 2021 uh, Sister Jordan preached a, a message called Strategic Prayer. If you have not re-listened to that ever, I would go back to that on the podcast. It is on the Jesus Church podcast, and I would, I would definitely listen to that again, jot down notes, write it down, because there is a, a powerful weapon of prayer that we have access to. And each of us has avenues and areas where we could grow, where we could become more proficient in our prayer. I don't know about you, but I want to be a better prayer. I want to be a more effective prayer. I want to be a more disciplined prayer. I want to be a more earnest prayer. Why? The end of the world is coming. It is already at hand, and God is looking for a people that will be watching for him. Amen. Let's move on in that passage of Scripture into 1 Peter Chapter 4 and verse 8, he says, Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. I found it interesting how Peter phrases that. Most important of all. He just finished telling us the end of the world is coming. You better be praying. You better be watching. But even more importantly than that, Continue to show deep love for each other because that love will cover a multitude of sins. Jesus said in John chapter 13 and verse 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. I am convinced that when people from the outside see the love of the church on the inside, there's a curiosity that rises up. When they feel the love, they step into the house of God and they, they feel the love coming from the people of God. It stirs something inside of them. Society's at each other's throats. I refuse to allow myself to be divided or turned against my fellow man, especially those inside of the church, especially those of the household of the faith. There there is no cause for division. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat, if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're slave, if you're free, if you were born Jewish, or if you were born Gentile, if you're you're black, if you're white, if you're anything in between. uh, There is only one church, and we are called to love one another. And by that love, we prove to that world that we are his disciples. See, our knowledge of the word is important. Our skill in prayer is important, but how we prove to the world that we're disciples indeed is to be deeply in love with one another. Love covers by forgiving. Love covers by extending grace. Love covers by refusing to gossip. That means you you don't talk about somebody in the church when they're not around and and, and somebody else comes to you. Don't entertain that voice coming to you. You say, no, 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 no. That's my brother you're talking about, and I love him. I love you, and I love him, uh, and I love both of you too much to allow this to go on. Why don't you go to him uh, and deal with whatever's going on? You see, a love will cover a multitude of sins. Why don't you turn to your neighbor right now, preferably not your spouse, find somebody else, and tell them, you are not perfect. Now I want you to look them back in the eyes and say, neither are you. And then I want you to say together, but I love you. Didn't that feel good? That's amazing. How come we don't hold ourselves to a standard of perfection, but then we expect sometimes our brothers and sisters to be somehow perfect? 
I've said it before, I'll say it again. We care more about our father's rules when our brother's breaking them than we do when we're breaking them. We look at ourselves and judge ourselves by intentions, but then we judge our brothers and sisters by their actions. We're not, we're not privy to their intentions, and so we judge by their actions. We, we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, saying, oh, my motives were pure. I intended to do such and such. But no, love for one another is going to cover a multitude of sins. Let's read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4. It says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. Help us, Lord. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. If, if there's somebody sitting in this house and you can tell them and you've got a mental catalog of every wrong thing they've ever done to you, then you need to go to them. There, there, there's a basis of a conversation that needs to be had right there until a place of forgiveness and love is reached because love does not keep a record of wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Now, here's, here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that, oh, I love you. You just, you just keep doing what you're doing. I, I love you. It's okay. No, 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 no. I love you enough to tell you the word of God. Because I love you, when you're walking in sin, I'm going to come to you with a meek spirit and say, brother, brother, you're caught up in something right now. I, I can't bear to watch this. Can I pray with you? Can I work with you? That's love stepping into a situation. Love is not allowing your brother or sister just to continue down the road that they're going on. Love is stepping alongside of them and saying, brother, why don't we look at Scripture together? There's something going on that's not right. Love is not sweeping sin under the rug. Love is not the church covering up a case of abuse or, or pretending that this or that did not happen. No, no. Love is we are not rejoicing at injustice, but we're rejoicing when the truth wins out. This is going to be a safe place to be. It's going to be a safe place to heal, to be whole, to be what God is calling you to be. We will not tolerate, we will not allow there to be a violation of that love and a violation of that safety. Amen. In verse 9, Peter goes on. We're just talking some instructions from Peter tonight. He says, cheerfully, share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. In the King James Cheerfully is rendered as without grudging. We're doing it backwards tonight. We're starting in the NLT. We're referring back to the King James. It's fun. I'm having a good time. We have seen this to be a pattern in the church. Open homes. I think sometimes because we live in the country and the time frame that we live in, we excuse ourselves from this verse. A Helpful Bible study for you to do sometime would be to look up this, the, the Eastern rules of hospitality, the, the way that they entertain strangers. It seems foreign to us, it's very different to us, but it is the context in which Scripture was written. That, that helps us to understand insane things like why Lot would offer his two daughters instead of the angels that were in his house. Because they had entered in as guests into his home and he was duty bound to protect them as, as people in him. The, the laws of hospitality would be a fun Bible study for you to do on your own time. But we, we are not excused from this verse. Now, be wise. Walk in the spirit. But open that home and allow others to come and to be a part of your home. Now, don't excuse yourself just because you don't have the nicest of furnishings. 
Many times we can get the mindset of, oh, man, well, does anybody really want to come to my house? I mean, we've got mismatched chairs. We, we don't have a matching couch and a, and a matching love seat. It's, it's all right, you know. Well, maybe when we get it all together, we'll have people over to our house. But the flip side of the coin is equally as active, too. Don't excuse yourself because you do have the nicest of furnishings. Well, so-and-so can't come to our house because our chairs might get dirty. See, both are pride. There's the self-protecting pride, and then there's the arrogant pride that's saying, no, my stuff is too nice for somebody to come over. It might get damaged. Is this all right? But utilize what God has given you for his kingdom. You'll, you, you, you've heard me say it before, but I'll say it again. Your home, your dining room table just might be the greatest tool for discipleship that you have been blessed with. Your ability to make a lasagna might be a gifting that God gave you to make disciples. And look, if you can properly craft like nine layers of beautiful noodles and sauce and ricotta and you can layer it in there and get the ratios just right and cook it just right where it's got that all going on and chop up a nice salad, you're like light years ahead of much of this world that's driving through McDonald's and to bring somebody into your home and offer them a home-cooked meal and show them what family love and family mealtime looks like together you are doing a spiritual work in that moment. How much more just to open the word of God? You're letting your life be an example. You're letting your family be an example. And if you'll do it cheerfully, you're fulfilling scripture. You're fulfilling God's commandment. And God will honor. God will bless. If you want a blessing on your home, you want a blessing on your family, use your home for the kingdom. You want an atmosphere to change in your home? You want God's hand to open on the finances of your home? You want God to help you pay off your home or to see your home protected? Make your home a base for discipleship. Make your home a place where the kingdom's business is done. God will protect a place where kingdom business occurs. He will have his hand upon your home where kingdom business occurs. Now that makes me chuckle because currently I had a, a, uh, a table thrown through my dining room window by a storm, but God is good. I believe he's working that out for my good because it has been our goal to use our home for kingdom business. Amen. Let's move on. Instructions from Peter. I do not intend to be very long tonight. This is, in fact, the last two portions of Peter we're going to read. One final topic, and then we're going to get moving along this Wednesday night. God has given each of you, Peter says, a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Every one of us in this room has a gifting from the Lord. And Peter says, use them well to serve one another, not to serve yourself, not to advance yourself, but to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ, all glory and power to him forever and ever Amen. Again, I, I believe that every person in this room has a gifting. Whether or not you're operating in that gifting or you have even discovered that gifting, you have a gift that God has given you. Peter is in agreement with the Apostle Paul, a major, obviously the major source of, of writings of the New Testament, because Paul writes this. We'll read a couple of portions of Scripture of Paul's writing about giftings in Romans chapter 12. In verse 6, he says, In His grace, God has given us all different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God 
has given you. If you've ever wondered why some prophecies seem more in-depth or some tongues and interpretations seem more in-depth, there's a proportion of faith on the part of the one operating in the gifting. And the more adept and the more skilled you become, just like that prayer that we're becoming more adept, we're becoming more skilled, we're becoming more confident, our senses are exercised by the reason of use, we can begin to prophesy to a greater degree with a greater specificity. So God is, you just, you speak it out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. There are people that have been gifted by God to have a gift of service. And if that's your gifting, then do it well. Execute it with everything inside of you. If you're a teacher, teach well. Not haphazardly, not last minute preparation, but prepared, knowing the source material, knowing where you want to go, and knowing techniques, knowing your students as best as possible so that you can most effectively, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, plant information down inside of their heart. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. I thank God for people whose spiritual gift is encouragement. Barnabas in the New Testament, it, Barnabas wasn't his name. It was given to him. Why? Because he was the son of consolation. He was an encourager. He was an edifier. He was known. And it's a gift that is in need. It's a gift that could be in greater supply. And it's a gift that we could hone because we need to be encouraging, lifting up, edifying, strengthening one another. I love this next one. If your gift is giving, Giving, a spiritual gifting from God given to some people. Now, each of us is to give in the tithe and the offering and to give cheerfully and willingly. But if you have a gift of giving, the Bible says give generously. Just give because God gave you that ability. God gave you that gifting and so use it for his kingdom. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. As a side boy, Romans 12 is an incredible portion of scripture for kingdom living, for practical instruction on how to behave inside the church. He writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4, now the gifts that we're more familiar with that we talk about more. For some reason, we don't talk about the gift of service and the gift of giving quite as, quite as much as the gift of healing. There's still one source. They all still come from God, and we need the gifts of encouragement just as much as we need the gift of healing. But Paul says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Three, three portions of Scripture we have read. Each one says the same thing. Everybody can receive a gift. They come from the Lord. And they're given to help each other. The giftings are not for you to put a feather in your cap and say, everybody, look at me. I prophesied so well. The gift is to help your brothers and sisters in the Lord. He writes in verse 31, so you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Don't covet the gift your brother was given. Covet the most helpful, the most needful gifts. I can think of a Christmas, I won't say which grandmother, but one of our grandmothers, I think, mixed up the age of me and my younger brother. And when we opened the present, I got a present appropriate for somebody that was significantly younger than me, and my jerk little brother got this really cool present that would have been perfect for an eight or nine-year-old like myself. And I tried to convince my parents 
And wouldn't you know it, I, I, I think I remember, it was, it was like a, a simple reader book with like the little buttons that you would push and they would like say things. And I'm like, dude, I'm eight years old, I'm plowing through books, and here I've got this little rinky-dink thing, and there's my little brother in the corner like, this is so cool, and he's using it wrong, he doesn't know what he's doing, and I'm like, that's my gift, but it didn't have my name on it. Look, if you don't like your gift, don't get, don't get angry at your brother. Go talk to the Lord. Take it up with him. He's the one that sent it. All of my complaining to my little brother or to my parent wasn't going to solve the fact that grandma had put my name on that gift and that one was mine. My gifting doesn't compete with your gifting. My gifting doesn't fight against your gifting. My gifting is intended to complete your gifting. And if we will walk in humility and we'll walk in love, we'll find out very fast that even though I may never get to prophesy and Brother Jeremy gets to do all of the prophesying, whatever gift I have that was given to me by God, when he and I work together in humility, they will complete each other and the body will be edified, grown, and strengthened. The body will not be in strife if the gifts are used appropriately with love and humility. Not everybody's the evangelist. Not everybody has the gift of giving. And certainly, not everybody has the gift of leadership. We would be dangerously imbalanced if every single one of us looked just like Bishop Brown or just like myself. We would have an imbalance in the church. It'd be like those people that are weightlifters that are totally stacked, but then they have chicken legs. Have you ever seen them? It's amazing. And then they got these little chicken legs. And you're like, dude, that's completely imbalanced. Now, obviously, there are some traits to emulate, to bring into your own life, because Paul himself says, follow me as I follow Christ. There are some things that you should see and you should bring into your life, but you are you and you have the giftings that I don't have. And so you need to find a place of prayer with the Lord and begin to grow and to develop those and allow them to be used for the body. We doing all right? Okay, just checking. Got real quiet there for a second. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 Final portion of scripture for the night. One final area of gifting that the church has been given. Perhaps we don't think of them as gifts, but clearly, well, let's read it. It says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. We know of the nine gifts of the Spirit. We know of the list of giftings from Romans chapter 12 and from 1 Peter chapter 4. There are a multitude of gifts, and each one is distinct and unique, and God has given each individual. But he also gave some to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. God has given to the church the gift of the fivefold ministry. Can you imagine if he just threw us all in a room and said, Go. Human nature would destroy that immediately. But God put, again, order and structure into the church. Now, it's not so that they can lord over the heritage of God, but it's for this reason. Their responsibility, it says in verse 12, is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Now, this church is awesome, but we're not up to the full and complete standard of Jesus Christ. And so the calling and the gifting of the fivefold ministry is still in place. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown away by every wind of teaching. We won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we'll speak truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Jesus Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body to fit together perfectly. And as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. If you'll forgive the silly illustration, 
We can't be a church that's stacked in the biceps and weak in the calves. We're going to be a well-rounded body. Why? Because everybody is going to operate and step into their gifting. That requires not just me, not just bishop, not just a few other people. It requires everybody, each one of us, to confidently step out into our gifting, into our calling. Now, if you're not sure what that is, there's a couple of things that you can do and you should do. Number one, you should pray. You should ask God, Lord, help me. I'm not sure what my areas of gifting are. Number two, you should meet with somebody. I would love to sit down with you. I'd love to talk that over with you. I, I would love to, to pray about that with you. Why? Because when every body part is doing its appropriate function, the entire body is grown up and strengthened and made healthy and full of love. I read one more time from 1 Peter chapter 4 where he says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. All glory and power will end up to God. When the body does what it was designed and created to do, God receives the glory. If that's not happening, something's out of order, and it's us. Let's all stand together in this place. I know we covered a few topics tonight, but just wanted to bring some instruction from Peter. If you leave with any, any thought or any, any key takeaways, I want you to remember the, the end of the world is coming. There's that encouraging verse again. But because of that, we're going to be earnest and disciplined in our prayers. You have a gift. And if you refuse to exercise it or you refuse to use it, you're weakening the body. So let it out. Let it flow. Let God flow through you and God will get the glory. And the body, this church, will grow stronger. Amen. Let's pray together as we close in this place. Lord, I thank you for the house of God.